We are pleased to have Mark Lampkin and Al Motter, two Washington insiders from different sides of the political spectrum, here with us today to provide their perspectives on the new administration, Republican-led Congress, as well as the new leadership at the FCC. As Senior Vice President of Government Affairs at TIA, I am honored to be hosting this conversation. Thank you both so much for joining us today. Thank you for having us. Thank you. So Mark, let me start with you. As someone who served on President Trump's shadow transition team, can you tell us about your experience with this White House and provide us with advice and counsel as we look to engage with this new administration? Yes, and thank you for having me. So you know, I, I think the one thing that we realize is that I've been counseling people uh, to be patient. You know, patient for a number of reasons. Um, you know, uh, the transition into the new government has been uh, slow but steady. Uh, there's, they're pretty top heavy, so you've got cabinet secretaries and you've got senior people in the White House, but you don't have a lot of, uh, I'll call them the worker bees, the people that are aligned. They're filling in slowly but surely at the White House, at the different agencies, but that's taking longer than uh, people expected, which I think can be a source of frustration when you know, you've got an issue for one of your companies or for the trade looking to have some get fast answers. When, you've only, when you're pretty top heavy, it makes it very difficult to get swift uh, uh, answers. Also, another thing that I think you're seeing with this administration is you know, truly uh, full of outsiders. You know, whether it's you know, from the president, who's not a politician, to a number of his cabinet secretaries who aren't veterans of the Washington scene, to people in the White House, you don't have people that have done this before. So every you know, new complex problem is one of first impression. So thinking about how you coordinate policy or between the cabinet agencies, the White House, and the different uh, silos within you know, the NEC, the Domestic Policy Council, you know, the National Security Council, making sure that you're coordinating all that is a, is a real task of bureaucratic, where you need bureaucratic experience and you have people who are still trying to get their feet wet and there's a lot of cement that's not dry. And, and then I think the third thing that really is informs how you deal with this administration is, is you know, the Trump by definition has set up you know, a, a, a council of equals. You know, inside the, you know, the kind of the White House, you've got four or five different power centers, all who vie uh, for the president's ear, uh, which means you don't have a lot of easy cohesion in terms of policy making because you've got you know, big titans of influence battling for the last word with the president. By all accounts, the president wants that kind of you know, free for all, but it really does make decision making a little bit more difficult, a little bit more tenuous. And for the outsiders, for you know, whether it's companies or trade associations, it makes it it's a lot less easy to understand than in previous both Republican and Democrat administrations where there would be one definitive way inside to be able to affect policy and the decision making and it was a lot simpler. So it's a complex but evolving circumstance with the Trump administration. Yeah, you know, if I might, Cinnamon, just to add on, on what Mark said. You know, if you think about where Trump came from out of the business world, you know, the way he seems to be structuring the White House and staff is more like a Bloomberg office in New York than a traditional government office. Traditionally in the White House, you have the staff secretary limiting the paper flow into the president. You have the chief of staff saying these people can come in and there's a schedule. But with this man, our current president operates more like a businessman, open door for eight, ten, six, six, eight, ten people. There isn't necessarily someone limiting the paper flow. He wants information from lots of different sources. And so I think that's by design, but it does make it more difficult for interested parties and special interests and, and, and lobbyists and advocates to figure out which way to go in. Yeah. And more acutely on that, it's interesting. It's not even, you pr probably in a traditional Fortune 500 company models more like a traditional White House. But remember, he's a, the leader of a family owned real estate empire where he was the king and everyone, you know, dominated by family and longtime insiders. And so that's a very different model than a corporate, you know, Fortune 500 where you have a C CEO, COO, and you've got division chiefs where there probably is more of a traditional funnel. In this place, it's really kind of a, he sits at the, cir the center of the circle and has lots of input, but he's the last decision maker and he doesn't want anyone controlling his inputs. I think that's really the lesson that we should learn moving into the future, that that's how this president's going to run his White House. Thank you. That's very interesting. Um, Al, let me follow up with you. Given your breadth of experience, both as a Democratic strategist and former Senate Commerce Committee counsel, you've seen the FCC change quite a bit over the last two decades. Um, 
Can you give us some historical perspective with respect to how you see this commission, led by Chairman Ajit Pai, approaching its mission? Well, if you go back over the last 20 years, Cinnamon, um, the FCC has become more partisan. Uh, historically, it has been an agency in which its best outcomes were driven by four to one and five to zero votes. Those are the votes that are le least likely to be challenged successfully in the DC circuit. Um, and if you go back to right after the Telecom Act in the late 90s, when Reed Hunt chaired the commission, he was a very controversial figure with Republicans perhaps in Congress, but he drove a lot of 5-0 decisions. And that's why much of the act was upheld in court. Uh, fast forward to the Obama administration, and under, particularly under Chairman Wheeler, the commission became exceedingly partisan. Issues that in the past um, had more geographic approaches, whether it's respect to universal service, broadband build out and the like, became uh, Republican and Democratic issues. He wouldn't share information with uh, Republican commissioners as much. And that dates back, you asked for historical perspective, to some prior commissions, but it became even more so to the f point that actually he wasn't sharing information with some of his fellow Democrats. And so rather than have an open, transparent process to drive consensus, it was a process to drive his preferred outcome. Now, now you have a Ajit in there. He's someone who comes from the political spectrum. He worked for Senator Sam Brown back on the Judiciary Committee. Um, he's somebody who has overtly championed transparency at the outset of his term there. For example, making orders uh, open and available to the public to read before they're voted on. That's uh, very unusual. I think it's a welcome change, and it gives people a, a window into what they're doing before they do it. And I think he's received uh, <sighs> Privately, a lot of plaudits from the two uh, sitting commissioners, and it remains to be seen who they nominate to fill out the, the, the bureau. But uh, I think thus far, the transparency is going to lead to more consensus and probably ultimately more success for Pi. Thank you. So the rest of my questions um, are open for either of you to answer. And just sort of following up on um, an issue that uh, all of the internet ecosystem, as well as TIA, is following closely is how this FCC will address the very politically charged issue of net neutrality. How do you see that issue playing out this year? Well, I mean, you know, it's, that's, that issue, again, that didn't used to be partisan. When I worked for Senator Hollings, when he chaired the Commerce Committee, we had all of these internet, nascent internet companies coming to talk to us. Back then it was called the Open Internet. Um, and there were coalitions forming that, that asked for regulation. And our response was, well, what's the problem? You're saying these things are going to happen in the future, but why should we regulate anticipatorily? Um, the Clinton administration, the Bush administration, and uh, until the end, the Obama administration had that same view. No FCC chairman, whether Democrat or Republican, thought that there should be regulation on net neutrality. Most notably, Michael Powell, who now chairs uh, the NCTA, believed in a light regulatory touch. And that touch, I think, occasioned massive infrastructure spending by your members, by other telecom and cable interests, um, which led to the proliferation of broadband options for consumers today. Uh, it occasioned competition with the wireless industry. Wheeler comes in and says, wait a minute, even though there hasn't been a problem, we're going to regulate anticipatorily because there might be one. And I think that that be became exceedingly partisan, and Pi, as a result, will try to undo that. And it will be viewed through a partisan lens. But historically, undoing it is actually consistent with about 20 years of precedent over there. Well, and I'll say, <clears throat> I think the FCC, in that respect, is just a creature of Washington. It represents what's gone on. I mean, the uh, Obama-Republican divide was very partisan. They didn't you know, work together on many things. And so I think you know, there was a push from partisans on the left to, do, to, to regulate net neutrality issues. And that reflected in what you know, Chairman Wheeler did. And then now there's an, a, a pushback from Republicans because you know, whether it's on the substance or just a knee-jerk reaction to that's an Obama thing, and I think that's what you know, the, the commission's battles on these issues reflects just the, the, the partisanship that exists in Washington. I think once they get through that, they'll be able to be more consensus driven on other issues. Okay, thanks. Well, one of the most complex and controversial issues Congress and the White House plans to tackle during the 115th Congress is tax reform. Can you provide us with your thoughts and insights as to the timing and how you see that unfolding? Well, you know, I think, um, it's a high priority for the president, House Republicans, and to a lesser degree, uh, Senate Republicans, but it's, it's a priority. 
problem is you've got to get through a number of significant prob you know, issues to tackle. You see right now we're in the, trying to figure out what to do with uh, health care reform. You're going to then have to deal with the debt ceiling and the budget issues, the you know, last year's appropriate bills, next year's appropriate bills, things like that. So that creates, there's a big uh, uh, it's a, 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 a pipeline problem, but more importantly, there's a substance problem. You know, you've got the House Republican blueprint that talks about, you know, is built off a, a very controversial provision, the border adjustability tax, which is really complicated. You know, unless you're just simply a domestic U.S. source of activity where you care about rates, almost everyone is global in nature, whether it's services, supply side, uh, 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 things coming into the country. So putting a, t a 20 or 25 percent toll at the U.S. border is really complicated because some people can live with it because they've got margins they can build in. A lot of people it can be devastating. And I think what the House Republican blueprint idea is, is running into a lot of headwinds because there's a lot of Democrats and Republicans in the Senate who's like, that's not my idea. And I think what that means Means in, but part of the reason why they are doing this border adjustability because in the environment, you know, there's a lot of push to do tax reform in a revenue neutral way, meaning it doesn't it has zero impact on the deficits. Well, to do that, you've got to figure out every dollar you cut, you have to find money to offset, to pay for. And the, the, the good thing about border adjustability, whether you're for or against it, it produces a lot of revenue. There, some estimates are $1.2 trillion. So that allows you to pay for in the Washington way, other tax cuts. There's a big move for us to make us more globally competitive, to reduce tax rates you know, on corporations for, you know, down to 20, 22, 25%. In order to do that, that costs a lot of money. And so it's a complex issue, but I think they're gonna make an attempt in the House to deal with it you know, after they get done with health care, which will probably mean that it spills over to next year. But then, and then the real question becomes is can they reconcile the vastly different world perspectives on things like this between the House and the Senate? Yeah, I mean, I agree with everything Mark just said. Uh, I think that interestingly, uh, th there's more interest on the Democratic side to work constructively on tax reform than there is on this health care process. But the Republicans have to get through the health care process, which then drives partisan hostility on the Democratic side before they get to tax reform. And so what remains to be seen is how hostile do things get now um, over the next couple months? And will Democrats be willing to come to the table, particularly red state Democrats in the Senate on tax reform? For years, Democrats have wanted to do particularly meaningful corporate tax reform. Uh, and they, like the uh, Chairman Brady in the House, want it to be revenue neutral. So maybe there's a way to get it done. Well, you just touched on this and another crucially important policy area for our companies uh, who have global supply chains is trade. The president was an outspoken critic of U.S. trade deals on the campaign trail. And in his first few weeks in office, he's um, lived up to his promises, withdrawing from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, threatening to pull out of NAFTA. His National Trade Ad Council advisor, Peter Navarro, has likewise been an outspoken skeptic of trade. And then on the other hand, you have Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross and USTR nominee Lighthizer, who've been more moderate in their mm -hmm. rhetoric. Um, how do you see this administration's trade policy evolving given these two factions? <clears throat> well, I, I think the president has said um, uh, he's not anti-trade, he's for fair trade. He's pro-trade, but fair trade. I think Navarro is kind of the outward uh, stalking horse, but I do think there's going to be a shift overall. You're going to get away from big, complicated, multilateral trade deals to more one-on-one -on -one bilateral trade deals, which the, the president and his team believe provide for greater import, you know, uh, equal, equal treatment for U.S. workers, U.S. interests. I think you're going to be looking for a deals that say, we're going to make sure that what we do doesn't reverberate to cause the, 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 the loss of U.S. jobs. So that's going to be a value. I think Navarro in particular is going to push for making sure that whether it's in the things that they do uh, for, to U.S. companies, really taking a, a, a long look at our relationship with China to make sure that because they do lots of protectionist things inside country that impact U.S. companies and there's a real under, he's got a real understanding of that, understanding that, that Chinese activity, whether it's on currency, whether it's on 
uh, wages really impact U.S. workers in U.S. industries. But I, but I would note with with someone like Bob Lighthizer, Bob Lighthizer worked as a you know a trade lawyer for a long time working for U.S. companies fighting battles at the WTO and across, you know, on cases. And so he, while more moderate than a Navarro, has certainly worked long and hard for a number of years to protect U.S. corporate interests. And I think that's what you're going to see. The president wants to, at the end of whether it's, you know, the, this Congress, at the end of this first term, going to reelect, wants to have demonstrated that he is protected American jobs, that we've shifted the balance of power from globalism to American-centric and takes that message across the globe and then and, and then force other countries to respond to what our priorities are as to becoming subservient to the collective interest around the globe. I just think two quick things to add. Number one, I think you're going to see more efforts at bilateral trade agreements rather than multilateral trade agreements. And number two, and this is evolving, but you have a White House and a president and his chief strategist and Steve Bannon who want to remake the American electorate. So what does that mean? That means taking, carving out pieces of the de traditional Democratic base and moving them over to the Republican side. One area they can do that in is trade. You see, uh, it's quite interesting. Trump's rhetoric on trade is probably closest to Bernie Sanders if you look at the 18, 19 candidates who ran for president. So I think you will see an effort for them to promote trade issues, in, as Mark said, couched in a way that protects the American worker. And I think you'll see an effort to do bilateral deals with some of our allies and others around the world. Well, my last question. Clearly, you both work very well together despite your partisan differences. Um, but as you well appreciate, there is um, a great deal of partisan rancor that exists across the country, and it's reflected in Congress. Um, how likely is it that Republicans and Democrats can work together to come up with bipartisan solutions this Congress? Let me start with this one. <laughs> you, you've got on TV right now a Gorsuch nomination. You've got every Democrat in the country angry about what happened to Merrick Garland. The guy didn't even get a hearing. You have a base on the Democratic side that I've never seen this exercised and irate. So there are a lot of senators, particularly, who want to work with Republicans to get things done, and they're being killed by their base for even hinting at it. That's the problem. That we have partisanship in Washington, but it's driven by partisanship from beyond. And I'm very concerned about construct the ability to forge constructive compromise. You've got 10 Democratic senators in states that Trump won running for a re-election. You've got 25 Democratic incumbent senators up for re-election out of the 34 who are senators who are running. It's a very difficult slate. And to date, only a couple, Joe Manchin, Heidi Heitkamp are the most notable, have even uh, publicly said things positive about the president. I was in New York after uh, the night of the election with one prominent red state Democrat who said to me, I'm going to work with the president. Uh, he won. Uh, he wants to do things. I want to do things. We're going to work together. Right now, this same senator is ripping him every chance that uh, she has. So that's a reflection of the anger in the base. Some Republicans think it's made up or paid for, but it's real. And I think until that subsides or until there's a meaningful thing that a senator or a congressman can point to that they can turn around and message to their constituents, it's going to be difficult. Um, so. I think they uh, continue this at their own peril. I think if you, I think this president has uh, done some counterintuitive things. Well, first let me say this: you know, I, this president, I believe, has worked harder to build your know, relationships and a structure of engagement with the Congress than the previous two presidents in any number in a significant way. He's up there every day. You know, he's talking to people. He's working this uh, health care bill and other issues like he's the head of Ledge Affairs, not just the president, which I think is good. Because I think if there's one thing that set a table for the poor relationships between the White House and the president was that President Obama didn't engage, was a little bit aloof. And when he did engage, it was, you know, as you know, former Speaker Boehner would tell you, it was all about him lecturing you what you should want to do and why you should want to do it, as opposed to a real sense of, like, let's work together. You know, but you've seen this president has paid, you know, uh, played footsie with uh, Elijah Cummings on drug pricing. You know, I think he's got an interest that's counterintuitive in big infrastructure spending, which is another kind of stimulus. You know, you're talking about a trillion dollars. You know, and coupling that with de a deregulatory atmosphere that could unleash a lot of people could, could unleash the economy to get it to four, five percent uh, growth rate, which would be good for him. And I think what he's going to do is lay out a cooperative challenge. 
that we are, here's some issues where you can and should, and then Democrats are gonna be faced, especially those red state um, uh, Democrats. Do I worry about whether I get primaried, or the, the Bernie Sanders folks, or do I take the opportunity to engage with this president on something that's bipartisan, or nonpartisan, that's good for the country, that's good for my state. The truth is they're postponing infrastructure, right? Well, what does that mean? That means that if they present a massive infrastructure package to this Congress next year, what do Democrats in states where they need jobs, where they need growth, where they need spending, say about being against it? It, makes it puts them in a tougher position and perhaps raises the likelihood that this White House could get something done there. Mark and Al, thanks so much for joining us today. Pleasure. Thank you.